We are we're getting into the good fashion. <laughs> this book. This section of the first book is when we start to get the fits. I mean, there are no night court fits. But I guess it depends on if you're springish or if you're nightish. Yeah, we're we haven't seen a lot of the courts outfits yet. So. No, mm. I know what they look like in my brain though, and spring isn't it for me. No, I mean I'm sort of wearing a spring court outfit. You do look very spring right um, now. In tribute to the, some one of the scenes in the in this se- uh, day of of episode. I don't know um, how you dress. How you can do it as a as a goth woman? I I'm trying to dress more fay, and like this is the most fay well, thing do, like, that I have because there's pom poms on the sleeves. You can do dark fay, okay? Yeah, I mean you look fayish. Do I? Yeah. Do I look like I could just winnow out of here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> it just looks like I'm gonna shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you introduced me to a good phrase uh, that you've coined that is. Dressed up from the breast up, which is what I am today. Dressed up from the breast up might be the best thing I've ever said. Sweatpants here. Dressed up from the breast up. Faye. Especially with Zoom fashion. I can't believe I haven't said this beforehand. Yeah. No, I love this. I love this for all of us. Yeah. Um, Oh, also, Jackie. I want you to be proud of me. Oh my God! You tabbed it. I tabbed my book. I love your tabs. They're so I am such a tab ass bitch. You're such a tab whore. <laughs> and uh, I ain't talking about the cats. <laughs> Although I like a tabby. Yeah, sure, fine. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna get off on the wrong foot with cat people. Anti cat natty jean. <laughs> I just alienated half of our listenership. <laughs> I'm pro cat. I am so. pro cat too. I am. I just love dogs. But let's yes. get a, let's get all of our listeners into a feud immediately. Okay. Okay. Cats v dogs, yep. and also spring fashion v night fashion. We're we'll get to that at some yeah, point. Yeah, we're not, we're not quite there, there yet. yet. But. Let's sing it. Let's go back to where we were, were. Where we were. <laughs> <laughs> where we were, were? Where, where we were, were. were. <laughs> we were actually in the last episode where we left off. We were just about to start entering spicy territory. Thank God, because I don't know about you guys, but I need more spice. And again, I'm not talking about Dune. Get out of here, Rude Duners, but also welcome if you want to be Fabe. Yes. Don't you, leave. It's it's a very comforting group where you just <laughs> lay in a meadow and think about your big beast of a man. Mm. I wish that we had the fields of Spring Court, though. I guess, you know what? I'm not a really big fields dweller. Yeah, but they have the magic ones. Yes, if I, if I can see the magic, if I can feel the magic, mm-hmm. but I don't want to just smell the magic like Feyre does at this point. Oh, wait, smell, yeah, the tang. Yes, because she smells the, the metallic tang of magic. Like, that sucks. Well, just, I want magic. It sounds like you have... You got punched in the in the mouth, and then you you have blood in your nose. Yes. Um, are you ever? Are you a blood sucker? I'm not talking about vampires. Um, are you? You suck the blood. You get hurt. You suck the blood. Some people like the taste of their blood. That's a slippery slope. Yeah, it is. Oh no, <laughs> we're not getting into blood play. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so in the last, where we last left off, not only that, but Feyre has begun to open up to both Tamland and us as the reader about her family's troubles, mm-hmm. where she came from, including more about her father's questionable business decisions. Bad businessman. Mm-hmm. Can we just say he lost everything and was just like, "Guess I'm just gonna get beat down and." not help my family yeah he'd really gotten he lost all of his 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 will it seems like his Um, mojo maybe he needed to get his groove back maybe and maybe he will Hmm. um but much like uh rose on the titanic her family wow (laughs) how how (laughs) famous family name was just masking a bad bit of debt oh just like rose on the titanic i was like well he's not drawing her in any of the in the field no you had to get there with me yeah Um, i was there i I went with you thank you for the journey (laughs) you're welcome so yes favor's family is just it was just a name really he so probably wasn't a great businessman oh she's not she's not speaking very well for father um well it sounds like he just sent out ships and was like 
Bye. He did. Well, where, all the luck to you. You've got all of my riches on it. Now, I don't know how boats work uh, necessarily. I know usually you think, oh, Jackie Zabrowski, that bitch knows boats. Yeah. But I don't. That's a boat bitch. And I guess if I was a merchant... Um, of not Venice, but of just a poor little town. Sure. It's a quiet village. Yes, every day. Quite like the like one, one before. before. Yes. Beauty and the Beast, um, everybody. Yes. <laughs> I think that uh, that sounds bad to me, that even in the real world, you're not supposed to put all of your money in one place. Mm. But he just put all of their wealth on ships and just went, bye. Yep. That's just business 101. It's like investing all of your money into like FTX. And then just being like, wait, it's in the bottom of the ocean now? Is that fuck that xylophone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the anti-xylophone coalition. Man, that sucks. Yeah. Because xylophones are great. Yeah, I know. It's fucked up. That's why it didn't do well. That's why people lost their money in it. The human xylophone. Um, <laughs> I'm coming in with a lot of energy today. I think I've had too much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> just enough. Yeah. I'm just ready to get down to this field. Yeah, so we are. That's where we are now. They're bonding like crazy out in this little trippy field where we left them off. She also has a moment as they're they're ending this little this scene, which you heard a bit of from uh, some gentlemen last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, she has a moment with Lucian as they're leaving where we see another threshold past that he decides to trust her with a knife. Go for him. I know, right? I think that's great. Also, this part does make me think of Midsommar. And part of it, like, when you say, like, that in the trippy field, I was, when I first read it, I thought that maybe there was some sort of, like, magic drug going on. Mm-hmm. And that I was here for. But no, there's no magic drugs at Interestingly, this point. Midsommar will come back up again. Midsommar. Midsommar. Uh, so at ch- this is at the end of chapter 18. As chapter 19 begins, we have the beast, I mean Tamlin, <laughs> oh! sort of doing the, the gentle giant dance where he's gruff, but all of a sudden he's trying to appeal to Feyre's oh. desires, get to know her. Oh. He presents her with this huge gallery of Fey paintings, which leaves her breathless, very akin to... The movie Beauty and the Beast. When you uh, go to the, the library books. with the books, and it does, does the same thing. But... We know that she was drawing from that. So, so yes, she's she's enamored by, you know, this is a great panty dropping move on his part. Oh, my part. God. They, all you want to do is paint, and then your big beast man is like, but look at all these paintings, of these fey paintings. It also tells a lot of the history of the fey and all and, that kind of stuff. And not only that, but then he gives her, here's an easel. Oh, goosh, goosh, oh, the paint, opportunity Feyre. to paint. If there's one thing we know about Feyre, man, she squirts for paint. She does. <laughs> she, maybe she squirts paint. Man, um, see, that would really help her out, <laughs> especially if she was poor. That's true. Who needs to squirt juices when you could be squirting some acrylics? Maybe she could have rubbed, <laughs> she could have mixed in some some berries or something. Yeah, in there. Oh my god. up. What is happening today? Uh, well, I get, I get the paintings funny. I can also connect with this feeling that she's having here of not having the ability to do something you love due to like fiscal circumstances mm. and how crazy it feels after you have some ability to have just pleasures again. Yes, like that was me for sure with ballet in my adult life. There was like you know five or six years of my adult life where I couldn't buy point shoes or buy classes or anything, but. It was still there. And then when I was able to do it again, it was like it was I felt kind of crazy because you just are like just living day to day for so long. And you're just like, I can dance again. I can dance. I could have danced all night. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you would have begged for more. I remember I had about a year where I only ate American cheese and mayo sandwiches from the bodega. (laughs) But man, my guys knew me and they sold them to me for 75 cents. Wow. Back in my day, you could get a cheese sandwich for 75 cents. I don't know if that many places could. No, I think they they, they called me boss every day. That was a special deal. Oh, that's really nice, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Bodegas are good places for the most. Certainly are. So at this point, Farah is starting to, dare I say, thrive. Oh my God, she's sliving. She is sliving. And as the days pass, suddenly she's hit with this other emotion that I can also relate to. Once you kind of have passed the threshold of like danger, is which is rage. <laughs> yes, man. Rage and fear and confusion, which is, 
you know, I've, I'm, I'm sure I've said this before and I, I know I didn't make this concept up, but like I think the reality processing trauma and dealing with mental health is kind of an, a privileged place because to an extent, because if you're trying to just make it from day to day, you don't really have the opportunity to, to you know, sweep out the skeletons in your mental closet. You're just trying to get through the day. Yeah, but maybe she should try squirting out acrylics and that will help. <laughs> I, I I wish that I had the means to say that to her. <laughs> um, so No, she really is. She's finally, she's getting into her own skin and she's finally dealing with what she's gone through. And of course it pisses you off. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. now she can put it into her art. Yes. Yes, her art. Um, so, But, you know, sometimes it takes that minute to be able to breathe. That's a very realistic human thing. Yeah. Right? Just like, oh, I'm fine. I'm so angry about everything now um, because you're dealing with those other shit. So this is sort of what happens to her here. She seems to be experiencing something similar whenever she's out one night reflecting on her family. And she just starts to walk through the darkness much like you walk through the streets sometimes, Jackie. Oh, yeah. Um, I love street stalking. They call me Night Cat for a reason. Yeah. Ow! Yep. So she's walking around just sort of like aimlessly going through stuff in her head on the manor's grounds. And she ends up at this rose garden, this rose bush, even pot- potentially the titular rose bush. What? So Tamlin, who is at all times watching her, which creepy, romantic, I don't know. How do you feel about that? You know what? I just, I don't know if it's just because I just got off the Twilight thing, but I feel like some, for me personally, I don't want someone staring at me all the time, especially if I'm not. So I think it depends on which, like if you're really in lust with someone, I guess it's romantic to have them just stare at you with longing. But um, I think in my real life, don't stare at me. Yeah, it's a real. Makes me feel weird. Real roll of the dice. Not everybody's going to be super into that. Nah. You know, so he I feel is, like my, my my immediate reaction is, can I help you with something? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in this instance, he appears behind her as she's staring at this rose bush and he lets her know that it's a mating present, actually, from his father to his mother. The concept of mating has been brought up already uh, in the book, but we haven't really had an explanation of it yet. But it is something that is like a big deal in the mm-hmm. Feywild. Enough that you get a whole rose garden out of it. Not just a, not just a bouquet. Wow. That's He must great. really like her. Oh, be, that's awesome. That I have to take <laughs> care of something now. Um, <laughs> something that's living? How dare you, you bastard. Yeah. He's sort of trying to lull her and quiet her because she's very upset and she's just not having it. And I, I like his very human response that most people can relate to at some point or another. They've been in a relationship and you have to go, you seem upset. upset. <laughs> and then just hope that they're not going to lash out at you. Although in reality, if if my husband said, you seem upset and be like oh yeah do it seem upset to you <laughs> yeah that's the risk mm. um but and it does piss her off she gets mad yeah so she in this rage she's in she rips a rose from the bush and she tears her skin open on the thorns oh. and her thoughts start pouring out she starts pouring herself out to him and finally finally herself getting to the core of her hurt all those years what i did for them and they didn't try to stop you from taking me She's talking about her family again? Of course they don't care about you, girl. They haven't for a long time. No. Uh, But she's finally, I think, coming to accept this. Mm. So then she feels kind of ashamed for having this omission to him and starts to backpedal. But Tamlin says, if it grieves you, then I don't think it's absurd at all, which is hot. Yeah, I guess. Um, And then they have this interaction. He took my hands. His calloused fingers, strong and sturdy, were gentle as he lifted my bleeding hand to his mouth and kissed my palm, as if that were answer enough. His lips were smooth against my skin, his breath warm, and my knees buckled as he lifted my other hand to his mouth and kissed it too. Kissed it carefully, in a way that made heat begin pounding in my core, between my legs. I'm sorry, that was a very... Uh, <laughs> I should have asked for your consent first, Jackie. Yeah, I'm upset I wasn't asked. <laughs> and now my loins are heated and I'm sitting next to her, my <laughs> sister-in-law. And there's going to be many times where this happens. <laughs> Especially um, as the book progresses. Yeah. Well, 
This is some of the most intimate touching that they've had thus far. Um, not only Faye flirty, but we see his magic mouth heals the rips on her skin. So, goosh, goosh, Yeah, goosh. it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, man. Can you imagine someone just sucking on it and then uh, you feel better? Healed. Whoa. Yeah, I can't imagine it, actually. Yeah, I bet. This is also, I feel like, the first time they talk about her between her legs. Because it I is. feel like they talk about, like, there's a lot of groin talk in these books. Yes. This is the first direct acknowledgement of her, uh, hu- uh, hmm. Oh, yeah? Her. What? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, they've, they've, like, basically alluded to it. And now we're starting to go, like, oh, no, she's, like... You know, she's feeling things. Also, Tamlin in this in this scene somehow gets the flower that she ripped out of the bush and he has dethorned it and he sort of like places it behind her ear. Oh, my God. It's almost like him and how he's disarmed by her and maybe his thorns are pulled off and now just the flower remains. Ooh. Yeah, I was a literature major. The flower is the vagina. Uh- Oh, um, what? <laughs> this, this, I guess, yeah, he took the thorns off her pussy, too. Yep. yep, yep, yep. Thank you, Damlin. Thank you. Um, well, and while this is very sexy and, and caring of him to do, I actually really want to come back to this interaction later on when we've read more of the books. Because with the full context of the other parts of the story, I find this interaction very interesting. But mm-hmm. that will be for another day. Man, there's so much we're sitting atop. I feel like we're sitting on a big, like, Pooh Bear's belly full of honey. Mm. That, that is one way to think of it. Sitting on his stomach. I say, where's the honey, Pooh Bear? This sounds like a different kind of erotica. <laughs> I'm just getting turned on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, this is perhaps the nod to the title. Or maybe this is where the title originated from. I'm not really sure if this came first or the title came first. But actually, I'd be curious to know. Hmm. The next morning, Feyre acknowledges that there's been a shift between the two of them. One heading towards the direction of the Bone Zone. Truths. She needs to get some fresh air because it's getting hot, hot in there. Air, so hot in here. Here's where it seems like she doesn't really mind that he's following her around because she basically knows he's doing it and she kind of baits him by going, I'm going to walk around now. And essentially she sets up a snare to catch him. And this actually wouldn't do anything to a, a powerful high face, so she knows that. So it's kind of like a... F- like a flirt? Yeah, it's like a punch flirt. Yeah. It's like a slap flirt. Like, yeah. stop! Yeah. She's going like, oh my God, what are you doing? You're obsessed with me. Oh my God, get away. It's are like, I hate it, but I'm like in love with you. I'm taking a baseball hat. I'm going to wear it backwards on my head, you idiot. Did you slap? Did you slap flirt? Um, I'm sure I did. I was such a slap flirter. I would just, I sat behind this boy who was a friend of mine and I would just hit him in the back of the head hit him in the back of the head hit him in the back of the head until he would turn around and go I don't know what happened and <laughs> why is like who who tells a 12 year old that that's what you're supposed to do like, why I don't did know I do but that? it's just the natural order of things how did he react to it um he didn't like it no he didn't like it <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to kiss me and I was mad about it <laughs> he was just sobbing yeah <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> Please stop. But he was a friend of mine. I think he was more scared of me. Yeah, no, I'm certain that I did that sort of flirting as well. Um, if I was even brave enough to touch a boy, I usually was not. So she runs. So during this interaction, she has him trapped upside down. He's like in like a, a snare upside down. And she runs his, her hands through his hair. Whoa. Ooh. And she begins to fantasize about what his purr would sound like against her naked body. Because he's a big cat man. He's just a big, like, everything, that, like, it's so interesting, too, the way they describe his movements. Everything is very, it's very beast-like. It's well, very animalistic. To the point that I have to keep remembering in my mind, I see him as the beast. And I'm yes. like, he's a blonde man. Yes. He's a man. Well, man-beast is a blonde man, but I think that he is as sexy. Who is cast in your brain? I think I had, like, a Chris Hemsworth in my brain for Tamlin. Mm, uh, yeah, I can see that. I don't know if I have a specific actor in mind. I have the image, and I am afraid also if we say exact actors, it will cause a ruckus on the internet because I think people it's are good. very opinionated. We got to talk about these things. Everyone has the dreams of what they look like in their head, and it's I true. feel like there are certain characters of this book. I don't know if they're going to be able to live up I to know. what they look like in my brain. I truly feel bad for the lead actors. <laughs> When they come to Hulu. Um, what Out there in the audience, who do you think Tamlin should be played by? Yeah, let us know. 
because this is going to be, I mean, we, we're, we're getting thirsty over here. So we got to have something in our brain to thirst about. Mm-hmm. I have to make it not a, ma- a thing that looks like a, an animal. Because I, that's weird. He looks kind of more like an animal in my brain, but I'm a monster fucker, so oh, I'm yeah, allowed. Right, right. I'm I'm under I'm under the umbrella tree of monster fucker, so I'm allowed yeah, to do that's this. That's true. So after they have this little like sexy tete tete, um, he presents her a poem, and. It's not. <laughs> I just. I'm sorry. I know that it's probably very romantic to receive a poem, but if someone that like I hadn't even started boning yet gave me a poem, I'd be like, the "Fuck is this?" But I think that that's just my my thorns. If I think. You will. Oh. Um, I think also if you didn't have like TV and, and entertainment, yeah. this would be like, "Wow, he yeah. made a thing." If you're squirting for Peyton, I guess you yeah. only have so much. But so he presents her this poem. The what this dumb it's dumb poem. Whoa. There once was a lady. I'm sorry. (laughs) There once was a lady most beautiful, spirited if a little unusual. Her friends were few, but how the men did cue, but to all she gave a refusal. See, I'm on the other side of the spectrum. I mean, yes. I think it's good. I, I, I know that I'm in the wrong here. I think a lot of people would love to receive a poem. I, I, again, somebody I'm not in a relationship with may be weird. Uh, <laughs> you get, but, does Henry write you a lot of poems? He writes me love letters. See, that's really nice. I But this, I feel like, is like, sorry. essentially what this poem is saying is like, you're a little weird and you ain't gonna fuck nobody. Like, that's what this poem says. It's not even talking about her beauty. It's true, but I, I mean, will he does say, say most beautiful, but you know what I mean. It, I think maybe it's supposed to be like lighthearted. Mm. That's my that's my takeaway from it. Mm. But it's also supposed to be sort of like a flirt. And the other part of it that I I think is really sweet is that he found the list of words that she was trying to teach herself. Yes, and then he uses them to cap the lines of this poem, and then the other handful of poems that he's made that we don't actually see because she can't read. She can't read. <laughs> Um, so this book, I mean, I find this very sexy in the sense that he came up with this very creative way to help her yes. learn. No, I, I am the like one. A sexy I'm daddy. being brash. It's sexy. It's sexy daddy. Teach baby how to read. You know, it's very nice. In in theory. I don't, I don't think I would like that in real life, but, um, in this, in this concept, I think it's very sexy. So on top of that, the poems he gives her progressively get more dirty. And by the end, he ends up making her laugh. Oh, my God. The Ice Queen? I know. It's the first time we've really had Favor express a joyful feeling in the book. And the quote is, Her laughter like sunshine, shattering age, hardened ice. Which I think is a, a nice little turn of phrase. Yeah. Um. So... He's done this and then she obviously is into it because this is the first time she's like smiled in the books. Um, shortly, man, nothing I fall in love with more than someone that literally can't smile. That's the thing. <laughs> That's what I find. So, but Tamlin is so rugged, so it makes sense that he would be interested well, yes. in someone that's a bit of an ice queen because he's also incredibly moody. Yes. Um, so, shortly after this, we get a, a quick clarification of what mating is, which is going to play a big part in this series. When Feyre questions Tamlin about his parents, we learn that mating is sort of above marriage in the Fey world. It's sort Sort of ordained by like an almost like a natural order kind mm-hmm. of thing um and that face can be mated but not like the best romantic couple in some ways so it's like nature is one thing and then your own personal feelings are another and it's they, like sometimes... are you the one yeah have you watched any of are you the oh, one no it's this a show, dating no. show it's a dating show where um they technically the everyone oh, like is paper. matched with yeah, on paper who you're supposed to be with and you keep trying to fuck people to see if this is your match and then they go into a chamber and they find out whether or not they are the perfect match for each other and most of the time their loins are making the decision and that's not good for them but occasionally sometimes loins and hearts work together yeah man and make thoughts yeah that's not what it would make no. i guess it would make lots lots <laughs> <laughs> i make myself laugh uh, <laughs> let's see so this is the this is basically the, the case with tamlin's parents his mother was a more loving figure but his father was a tyrant he was very cruel and he was actually a keeper of human slaves so it seems as though Tamlin's father he's got daddy issues they both have daddy issues huge daddy issues if his okay wouldn't you though if he had human slaves at your house um 
you know, he he basically goes on to say his father during the big war that happened where human and Fay like separated from each other. Um, well, let's just say his father would have been a big fan of the Confederate Army. Mm, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. So fortunately, the good of Tamlin's mother worked into him enough that he disavowed his father's behavior. So that's good. Yes, that's a plus. But it seems like he doesn't have as much mommy issues, no. but definitely more daddy issues. Daddy's a bad man. Brothers a were bad men. Mm-hmm. Mommy's good. Yeah. Mommy's dead. Mommy's good. Mommy's dead. They're all dead. In fact, they were killed by an enemy court. Um, in fact, he didn't want to be High Lord. He was sort of forced into it. He was wanted to be a soldier. Oh, my God. Is he Harry? See, that's the thing. See, <gasps> this is the thing. This is what makes my panties sluice is because he doesn't want to have the power, mm. but he is destined to have the power. He has no choice. So he steps up, which that makes me goosh goosh. Yeah. Oh, no, I agree. Um, even though he constantly is mad about it but he yeah he's a pissy boy but oh don't we love a you don't marry a pissy boy but you fuck a pissy boy mm, i'm well, saying in real life in real life yes so he had to step up into this role and his powers also were like superseding his brother so they might have killed him anyway so it's probably good they were murdered yeah that's what i'm saying i guess um he, in fact, doesn't consider himself to have the traits of a high lord, but too bad. Because he does. Because he is, and he does. As we learn of Tamlin's history, the duo are observing the, the court servants setting up these massive bonfires across the sprawling hills of Spring Court. Man, all their celebrations seem so fucking awesome. I know. We learn from Tamlin in this scene that it is in preparation for Fire Night, otherwise known as... Colin Mai. So Tamlin's being a bit evasive. <laughs> oh no, Sorry, she's even, getting revved up. <laughs> just reading it again. The second we got to Colin Mai, I was just like, okay, All right. uh, ready for this? Uh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> like we don't have sex constantly. I, know. I don't know why this is doing this to adult women. but because That's what these books do. I, I am already a very horny person. <laughs> and then to read, a hor- like I don't know need literatica in my life to get me going but then i do and jeff has said many times he's like he would know i'm reading a spicy scene because like i can feel you vibrating next to me as you read it i have no chill when it comes to these books i wish that you would read them in like starbucks uh, yeah just <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, yes, they're setting up for this this ceremony and Tamlin's being a bit evasive about what they do during the ceremony, but says it's performed to generate magic for the coming year. And I personally would like to volunteer as tribute. Please, I'll make magic. It's just because I really like to give and to help. Yes. You know what? I love that about you, Natalie. You. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll both sign up, but for very different time periods. Oh, please. Uh, no, <laughs> not we're not doing that. <laughs> we'll um, go in shifts. Okay, great. <laughs> this is a turn because there will be evidently more fairies than usual on the grounds, ex- expanding the world a bit of Prithian. But Feyre is not permitted to go. She's not allowed. She is not happy about this, as I would be also very annoyed. Even though she doesn't know the events of the ritual yet, I'd be a curious little cat. I would be a curious cat, but there's no way. See, this is how I know I could never actually be a heroine in a book like this. Because if someone told me I wasn't allowed to go, I would like a like an like a puppy be at the window just being like, I wish I could go <laughs> to the party. Uh, and I would never like Wendy. Go. I'd be just like Wendy. Yep, I'm just like your dog. <laughs> only but that, I would be only then. I'm like, Wah! Only, <laughs> only in that moment. I like jerk Wendy. off and go to sleep wow. like a normal person. Wow. Wow. And so as they're having this argument and they're trying to get over this awkward, like, you can't go. I want to go. And he won't even tell. See, this is the whole thing. The daddy thing. Mm-hmm. He won't even tell her, like, what's going to happen. All he says is, you're not allowed to go. And you don't tell Farah that she ain't allowed to go. And especially just tell her what's going to happen. Maybe maybe she wouldn't go if you just clued her in a little bit more. They leave her in the dark about so much. It's true. And this this theme will come back throughout the stories. Mm-hmm. Um, suddenly, as they're doing this, though, Tamlin tenses and he tells Farrah to hide now. 
Confused, Feyre observes Tamlin and, and Zaddy Lucian <laughs> speaking to. I'm a, also very sexually attracted mm, to Lucian in my head. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, um, speaking to a creature she can't see, but she she's watching them have this terse confrontational interaction with this this thing, who apparently is a delegate of this mysterious she who Feyre is beginning to piece together. This bad mis- girl, the bad, bad. Mm, the baddie, baddie. This mysterious lethal woman that she doesn't really know much about. This creature, it, she calls it an it, comes with a warning to stop acting out and asks Tamlin why he hasn't given up yet. Tamlin argues back they have this interaction. The invisible thing laughed again. Such a horrible, vicious sound. Though you have a heart of stone, Tamlin, it said, and Tamlin went rigid. You certainly keep a host of fear inside it. Oh, that was good. Yes. I'm scared of you. Good. <laughs> they get this good. <gasps> um, they get this creature to flee, and Feyre finds out its name is the Atter. The thing laughed again before a flap of leathery wings boomed. A foul wind bit my face, and everything went silent. Hmm, curious. Hmm. That is is something that we may be seeing again. Mm -mm. The next day when Feyre's... Yes, Painting! painting, Jackie! When she's painting! She reflects. When I sat down to paint, what emerged on my canvas was a tall, skeletally thin gray creature with bat ears and giant membranous wings. Its snout was open in a roar, revealing row after row of fangs as it leaped into flight. As I painted it, I could have sworn that I could smell breath that reeked of carrion, that the air beneath its wings whispered promises of death. Very spooky. Ooh, I don't like that thing. Mm -mm. However, the day of Colin Mai has now arrived. Colin Mai! Feyre finds the house empty as all of the staff and Tamlin himself are in the hills preparing for this so-called ritual. We get the sense that these preparations exude a, a sort of earthiness, a sensuality, <clears throat> which is common in spring rituals here on Earth. Observances mm-hmm. like Beltane and, whoa, wait, Callan Mai? Yeah, it's an actual Welsh version of Beltane. Um, I didn't know that until I was doing the research on this book, but Callan Mai is a real holiday. Um, that is basically just a Welsh version of, of, of Beltane or also very similar to Valpurgisnacht. Um, Beltane is of Gaelic origin and most like most pagan rituals was about luck or prosperity or fertility, which is really along the lines of what they're doing here in the book. Interestingly, there's a warding off of fairies in many Beltane traditions. Whoa, but we want to bring them in. I know. They were wrong to be warding them off. Many Bel- Beltane practices were designed to ward off or appease the fairies and prevent them from stealing dairy products. Don't touch my milk! My milks! My Leave butters. my milks and my nipples where they belongs! That was me. <laughs> I don't know what, what character that was, but it lives within me. I guess me. you're saying that's how Gaelic people talk. Yeah, I think I was just thinking of like if someone was like trying to snap at my breasts and my breasts were full of milk, like that's how I would respond. Mm. But I, I don't know. I do, don't you maybe want the fairies to come take them? If I didn't have anybody to give the milk to, like if we, if this was like a Grapes of Wrath situation, uh, mm. then yeah, come have that with my milk. I'll share. All right, cool. Um, and yes, Beltane in all of these sort of real world rituals include big old bonfires. Sick. The Wicker Man, which you may have seen before the as a bees! movie. <laughs> the bees! It's drawn from these traditions, though Nicolas Cage is not typically <laughs> trapped inside. Um, Although sometimes, sometimes it depends be. on the Colin Mai. So you see a lot of Beltane imagery in Meat Summer. Oh my well. God, you were going to bring up Midsummer again. Several times. Um, such as the Maypole dance. So this is also stuff that they have uh, going on here at the Kalen Mai um, rituals. And so, yeah, Beltane's a very old holiday. And Val- Valpurgisnacht is also a very similar tradition. Uh, sort of like All Hallows Eve and All Saints Day, which is more of a Christian version of the same thing. Basically, they all the holidays are sort of just interspersed with each other. And Colin Mai is considered a spirit night in the Welsh tradition, and it is about— Sounds like everybody's going to get hammered. 
Yes. The, I've had the, a couple spirit nights in my day. Well, it is. It seems like, I, I can't speak from personal experience, but it seems like the Welsh call in my, which is considered a spirit night when spirits are out and about and divination is possible, uh, involves a lot of drinking. <laughs> Why aren't we celebrating this? In the same way that I want to get rid of Easter and just call it Spring Thanksgiving mm-hmm. so that we could just have another, I just want another like holiday where I don't give a fuck about a cave and zombies and stuff. Yeah. Like, I, although, sick. That sounds cool. Yes. If we just, if we celebrate the zombie part of it yeah. and then we all eat a bunch of food together, Spring Thanksgiving. Yeah. That's what I want. Well, and so maybe we need more Colin Mai and Beltane in our life. Well, the Pergusnacht is a, now being... Practice a Sorry, lot. Sorry, and also practice not. Which is Henry's birthday, by the way. Oh my God, May Day! All of this is really May Day. It's all kind of the interspersed together, like most holidays. But yeah, well, Pergusnacht is popular again in Europe, and also Hekensnacht, which is the same thing basically, or Witches' Night uh, in Dutch. Um, so yeah, that is actually a lot of like the big Beltane type. F- like bonfires and stuff are, are kind of popular again. We just need to bring it back to America. Sick. Let's do it, man. Let's do it from the... Come on, Faye Bays. Faye Bays. Let's get it together. Go down. May Day. We're having May Day, but Faye we're Bays not going do May down. Day. Faye Day. Oh, my God. <laughs> Faye Bays do May Days. <gasps> oh, that's fun. Maybe we should try to figure out we how to make to that. We have to do something now. So this is all carried through into this storyline. And as the sun goes down on Colin Mai... Feyre watches the fires being lit on the horizon and laments over not being invited to this party. Sort of a a little little puppy window. That's me. uh. She doesn't understand why. Has she done something wrong? Suddenly, as she's in the house, Tamlin (laughs) appears before her. There's something so sexy about the word baldric. I don't know if I said this last episode. He was shirtless with only the baldric across his muscled chest. The pommel of his sword glinted golden in the dying sunlight, and the feathered tops of arrows were stained red as they poked above his broad shoulder. I stared at him, and he watched me back. Oh, take up that baldric now! And I love a baldric! I mean, it is very phallic, so that makes sense. <laughs> um, yes, the warrior incarnate indeed! Uh, he again demands. Oh, I'm sorry, that, I didn't say the warrior incarnate. Um, he again demands to, that she warrior stay in her room for the night. Warns her, in fact, to set up a snare in front of her door and is gone into the sunset. Just no shirt on. Mm. Woo! And then she, he just wants her to sit in her room. Woo! Come on. Come on, give me some. That's what I'd say. <laughs> Come on, just give me give some. Me first. some. Give me some. Um, <laughs> Poor Jeff, every day when he tries to get ready to go to work, I'm just, I'm, I harass him. I sexually harass my husband every morning before, because if he just has on his socks and his underpants, I will chase him around the house and go, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, gimme, we play the gimme game. He likes it. Yeah, oh, he loves it. So, <laughs> you gotta keep it fun. <laughs> But Feyre can't, she can't let go the be- the tempting beat of the drums or rush- rushing through her blood and coursing through her. Curiosity is getting to her. In fact, there seems to be a voice inside her whispering, go, go see. Mm, it's Which me. Girl it's inside of her brain. Yeah. Can relate. Can relate. Go. Go to the party. So she does. She decides to creep out. She steals away on a horse. Even though there is some form of glamour over her to blur the creatures dancing in the night, she continues to sneak through the crowds and music and laughter. No way. There's no way I would do it. I would I would scared? be I would be way too scared to do something like this. Again, I'm not a heroine. I'm a side character. Well, in reality, this is a very fairy tale logic thing to do. Normally you would just be murdered, right? If you're going to do something this dangerous. Yeah. There's no reason she wouldn't be, but we're going they under hate humans. Like don't we, what are you doing? We go under suspended disbelief in this moment. But yes, it's a bad idea. Yes. Um, Feyre, during this uh, this little look around, she notices a cave opening. And there are tributes laid out in front of it. Hmm, what is going on here? She's making her way through the frivolities. And she's startled when somebody grabs her arm. She turns, cornered by three fairies. And they're not wearing masks. They're not of the spring court. Nope, only a spring court has the masks. She describes them as almost insect-like. It's clear they are danger. Oh! They start to terrorize her, throwing out innuendos at her being intimidating. Human woman. She panics. She's frozen. They have her cornered, and they begin to drag her into the tree line, which you know is bad news. And when another pair of hands grab hold of her. They were strong hands, warm and broad, 
not at all like the prodding, bony fingers of the three fairies who went utterly still as whoever caught me gently set me upright. There you are. I've been looking for you, said a deep, sensual male voice I'd never heard. Standing before me was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. The stranger with raven black hair and violet eyes is not of the spring court either, as he's not wearing a mask. Can you imagine meeting someone with, with violet eyes? I'd melt into a puddle. Yeah. Um, That's this... hot as shit. Like, it's, it's like green eyes are already really hot, but then violet eyes? Mm-hmm. She is. She's taken aback by his beauty. Whoever he is, these other spindly fuckers are afraid of him, and they basically run for the hills when he shows up. Go out! Go out! Go get! Just as Feyre is feeling a sense of relief, she realizes this man is also giving her a vibe. Not only that, but the power that is coming from him trumps the other three monsters she was just facing. She might be in a worse situation now than she was a second ago. He's a smug, arrogant fairy, watching her and pacing like a shark. He wants to know what she... A human girl is doing at this call in my celebration. She stumbles her way through a couple of bad lies, which she's clearly not falling for. Strange for a mortal be- to be friends with two fairies. He mused and began circling me. I could have sworn tendrils of star-kissed night trailed in his wake. Aren't humans usually terrified of us? And aren't you, for that matter, supposed to keep to your side of the wall? I was terrified of him, but I wasn't about to let him know. She starts to shake him off when all of a sudden she feels this compulsion to ask him another question. Is he part of the spring court? Girl, does he have a mask on? That's what he says. (laughs) Do I look like I'm in the spring court, bitch? Um, No, he says, absolutely not. He's disgusted at the concept of it. And he continues to stare her down like she's food. But he doesn't pounce on her. So she hightails it out of there, and she tries to just hide right back into the crowd of fairies, which I would just be like, you should probably leave, girl. You know? Man, I love looking at people like their food. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how I got a husband. That's what I did. I just went, yeah, you look like you're drippy and that you don't taste good. That's not what happened. He, That's he what very happened. much pursued her. No, he was very nice. Um, So... <laughs> <laughs> she gets out there and she's hiding again in the crowd and kind of realizing she might be over her head. Just as this is kind of happening to her, Lucian clamps on her elbow. She's getting gripped a lot in this party. A lot of people are gripping her well, elbow. Well, she's not supposed to be there. Yes. And in shock, he says, have you lost your mind? Why, why would you do this? And he doesn't even want to know why, why she's there. He just basically swoops her up like Edward Collins style and like flies through the forest in a fast run. Yeah, except I bet it was sexier than when Edward Cullen did it. I mean, we're just going to assume. So, yes, it's not hard to do to make it sexier <laughs> than that. So, Favorite doesn't understand why he's so upset. Here's where we learn that the great right, what it actually is. On this evening every year, the High Lord must take a maiden and bang the magic out of her. God, it's so hot. Just thinking about banging the magic out of somebody. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. I guess I'd rather bang the magic into somebody. (laughs) But if you bang them so hard that they just, like, shake out the magic, just like, "Ah!" like, I just imagine, like, shooting stars, shooting from her. She goes, "Ah!" (laughs) is that how you assume? I'm assuming that's what happened in that cave. Uh that he must, the coupling will help to keep the lands enchanted and healthy for the coming year. Oh. So Lucian says. We have to be doing Colin Mai every year. I know. I mean, this is also like, there are so many fertility sort of nods in Easter celebrations too that are pagan based. And like, we should just be doing this style. Yeah. Um, with adults. Yes. With only, not the kids part. No, they, they can old. Still have the, I want them old, They can still have the, the candy and stuff. You have to be at um, least 35. Yeah, I don't want any, like, young adults either. Um, I'm 35, so I'm allowed to say it's old. I choose this age. She chose it. <laughs> <laughs> she identifies as 35. I, forever now. I'm just like Mariah Carey. You know, she won't officially say what her birthday is. But She refuses to. Everyone knows she's everyone in her 50s. Knows. <laughs> It's not like it's big. You can't. It's the internet. You can't hide that. Um, she says it's her anniversary. It's not her birthday. Oh boy. She calls it her anniversary. 
I think she should just be like, I'm in my 50s and I'm hot. Fuck you. Yeah, man. So then Lucian goes on to tell her that Tamlin sort of goes under a spell during this ritual and that you can't interact with him because he becomes a different fae than the one that she knows. In fact, Lucian goes on to say that once Tamlin picks the maiden, the whole thing basically turns into an orgy. Dude. So they all just sort of couple, copulate. Yeah. Uh, So that's fun. Awesome. She is not super jazzed about this news. No, because she wants to make fuck on him. She, Even though she keeps the rain on her feelings, even in her own head, that, as we're reading, it's clear that she's beginning to develop some strong feelings. Yeah, for, for her protector, which, you know, again, daddy issues, I completely understand. Sure, sure, sure. And now he's off dallying with some hot harlot. I mean, He has crump. to do it for the magic. She's trying to remember, you know, yeah. and she's just like, but I still hate it. She's trying to get a grip on these feelings while sitting in her room when she feels a big burst of magic cross the land, which I guess is Tamlin coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it is. Woo. Imagine the roar that happens. Oh, my goodness. So. <laughs> we're not even at the horny part of the book. Like, I, it's just no. the beginning of the horniness. <laughs> She can't help running the scenario of this coupling over and over in her head, and she can't sleep. And so she decides to go down and get a snack from the kitchen. As she returns, Tamlin appears. This is the first scene that gets really uh, go that gets you. Ooh, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Tamlin is still in his magic zone, his his other ego, which is a way to it's a good like writing device to let go of the restrained inhibitions they've both had to display through like the, you know, the normalcy of of uh society. Daily life. Yeah. yeah. He sees her and he can't control himself. He pins her against the wall. Now, you gotta remember as this is fantasy, she's fighting him, but we know as the reader from context and access to her thoughts that she's willingly playing into this little drama scene. We love a consent king here. Yes. We have to use suspended disbelief a little bit to accept that she She's under a spell. Right. And that Feyre is also into it. Yes. Like if she was actually upset, I feel like the character Tamlin would have let her go. Yes. I'm not going to read the whole passage because that's for somebody else. Yes. But this is where stuff gets turned up. My favorite part of this interaction is this. I uh, see now I'm going to say a dirty thing. <sighs> Yo, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I would have you moaning my name throughout it all, and I would have taken a very, very long time, Feyre. <laughs> Not that that's always what we want. I'm going to throw I mean, that out there. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know that romantic wise, yes, it's very nice. But sometimes it's like, all right, let's clip it along. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, as he has her pin there, he gives her what is essentially a hickey and then manages to control himself. And she slaps him across the face. Woo! And I like that when he tells her not to disobey him, she says, don't tell me what to do. Woo! However, <laughs> Feyre is shooketh. Yeah, dude. In her Wouldn't core. you be? Can you imagine? He actually scents her arousal and basically runs before he can't control himself anymore. Very <laughs> sassy. Mm. The next morning, Feyre decides to let the hickey he's given her show at the breakfast table in sort of another nagging flirtation. I love this scene. It makes me laugh every time, and it sort of makes me fall in love with Lucian. I love Lucian so much. I lo- I really I fall in love with him more and more every time I read this. Totally. It gives them all, also, all three of them, it gives them a sense of personality that I find endearing, where it's very, even though they're fae, it's very humanizing because they're all hungover. The, the scene is ended by Feyre thinking about making a painting of Lucian and Tamlin as pigs because they're like sort of teasing her they're and razzing her because obviously like Lucian's just like, oh yeah, where'd you get that? Yeah. What happened on your neck? Yeah. And so she realizes she's feeling true happiness for the first time in a long time after this interaction. And she also goes to a, a peaceful rest. So obviously she's not really upset about all the things that just happened. Nah, dude. And then the next night, she decides to <gasps> wear a dress. Oh, my God. But she loves her her pants. I know. Well, what? But she's a she, trouser bitch. But does she love them? I guess some people would also see this as like a roll, an eye rolling thing of like, oh, she's going to wear a pretty dress for him. No, but- it's because she's finally feeling like a sense of herself again mm-hmm. because she wore the pants because she had to wear pants to yes. hunt. Agreed. That's that she had to, like that was a, a more of a like a costume come by like what you're talking about before of like not having the things that she wanted, not being able to do like not being able to paint. 
It was that now yeah. she's able to wear a dress. Everything was utilitarian to her before because it had to be. So take off that baldric. We don't actually. Wow. Yeah, she's never indicated that she doesn't like dresses. She yeah. just was wearing them for her own needs, uh, wearing pants, that is. So now she's sort of like letting her guard down. And I think that's actually like a power move on her end. Yeah. At the scene where she's getting dressed, Alice is helping her get ready. And we learn here that Alice, her, her, Handmaiden? I don't really know yeah, what to call her. Yeah, I think her. handmaiden. Uh, is not from the spring court, but rather the summer court. Um, so she's from another land. And so, yeah, so this is when we get one of the first, like, fun little fashion-y things. And sh- this dress is one that's, like, metallic lace with an overlay of a turquoise sheer overgown. So you get, like, the glowy gold. I don't know if this is boring to you, but I like looking at all the dresses. Dude, I'm totally down to talk about fashion. I, and I love that you've coined a new term. I love the fashion that happens in here. And, again, even, like, the the design of this sounds much more sick than I would think you would wear at a spring court like in that totally. I feel very like like you're wearing much more like like you're almost like water or something yeah like I mean I don't know if that's what you're gonna say but I but I like it yeah it's I didn't like, know what I was gonna say I love I just want to wear all their outfits and like just this f- like flowy airy kind of like s- like surreal fabric it just sounds so cool to me um so Feyre is super nervous as she walks into the dining room and a dress is and that's also very endearing to me she walks in and Lucian says, well, I'm late for something incredibly important. And so he's so cute. Oh, my God. Uh, he knows they want to be alone because yeah. she shows up in a dress. And finally, because remember, he went to the field with them. Before. Yeah, so get, get out, out of here. here. So Tamlin and Feyre proceed to have a sort of romantic dinner where she learns that Tamlin's powers have been drastically reduced by this blight. So she thought he was so powerful. So if that's only part of his power, Ooh. oh my god. Oh my god. Feyre tells Tamlin she has a gift for him and leads him to the gallery where she's painted him an image of the pool where they had their little field flirt. Ooh. He starts observing all of her other paintings lined up around the room and finds one she's made of her forest back home where she shot Andress. The Andres, wolf. Andres, in wolf form. The scene kind of makes me laugh because he doesn't w- want the painting she made for him. Yeah. He just goes and picks another one up like it's a store. Yeah. Also, he never actually says her paintings are good in the scene. Does he not? So I always Maybe can't. Maybe she's really, <laughs> really bad. I can't it. help it in my head. Just <laughs> They're just like crude stick drawings. <laughs> I made it for you. And he was like, oh, oh the frame oh. is great. Man, wow, the craftsmanship of the frame really gets me going. I painted a painting. Good, good baby. Um, <laughs> it, because, again, though, because not to do the good baby thing, but I do feel they do have a very, like, although it is heating up, it is definitely a protector versus yes. damsel situation that they've got going and um and I think that's part of the paintings of like you did really good right and and some people like yearn for that sort of interaction or sort of like dynamic with their their lover but we're also getting this other sense that favor is not really this already she's a she's a fighter she's a, a huntress yeah she's very opinionated so we'll see how that you know dynamic Plays ends out. up going <sighs> Anyway, this interaction ends with Faye basically dropping her panties emotionally mm-hmm. because he says her paintings remind him that he isn't alone. That chapter ends with, I didn't lock my bedroom door that night. So chapter 23 opens with Faye and Tamlin finally not with Lucian in a field. While Tamlin acknowledges the willows singing always puts him to sleep. He remembers that Feyre can't hear it because of her wretched humanness. It's boring being a human. I want to be Fey. I know. I'm so bored with it. We get a Fey flirt here where he offers her to see through a Fey's vision in exchange for a kiss. Feyre surprises herself by quickly agreeing to this deal, much like when his mouth healed her wounds. He kisses her eyelids and it does... His mouth does things to her, so. <laughs> Can you imagine um, what else they could do? Wowie, Come on. Wowie. She's presented with not only the heightened sights and sounds of face senses, but she sees Tamlin without his glamour. It was Tamlin, but not. Rather, it was the Tamlin I'd dreamed of. 
His skin gleamed with a golden sheen, and around his head glowed a circlet of sunshine. And his eyes, not merely green and gold, but every hue and variation that could be imagined, as though every leaf in the forest had bled into one shade. This was a High Lord of Prithian, devastatingly handsome, captivating, powerful beyond belief. Ugh. Mass just does, I love her her imagery in these scenes. I just think she makes it sound so appealing that I don't want to be a person anymore. It's just, it's so horny. Like, is that not so dripping with horn? Just, not even just his, like, hotness, but, like, just all the, just her seeing the world through yes. the eyes of, of him. So then she wakes up in her room after falling asleep during this, and she still has the remnants of Tam- Tamlin's face sight and realizes that she can see Alice in her true form, which is... She's made of basically tree bark. Mm -hmm. Um, She's been glamoured to look more human so as not to terrify this young, terrified woman when she arrived at the spring court. Not only that, but there were actually tons of humanoid staff members there the whole time with the trio, whereas Feyre thought there was only a handful of people at this manor. So this entire time, she thought that this manor was, like, essentially empty, but turns out there were just a bunch of Fey all around her at all times that she just couldn't see. This would, which, uh, personally... This would piss me off so much more than it pisses her off. I understand the reasoning behind it because he's trying to protect her yes. and he's trying not to have her be scared. But as a as a person, I would be so mad. Yeah. About like, how dare you say that I couldn't handle it? Uh, Yeah. Also, just it's not even just that, but the the weird invasiveness of it. Like, yes. I if I'm not. Like being observed, I probably look insane. I talk to myself. Yeah, I want to know if I'm being looked at. Yes, Uh, she doesn't seem super bothered by it. I was very surprised that she doesn't get more pissed off at this point. She's too horny, I guess. I mean, I have been there. Um, (laughs) she's like, I'm gonna table this and bring it up in like three years. uh, What if if we fuck first? Yeah. So yeah, no, I was just like, "Mm, mm mm-mm. So. That's weird. But anyway, the next morning, Feyre is shaken to find a severed head spiked atop a fountain outside the manor. So basically, she she finds the severed head and it like shot uh, very scary for her. Um, it's all fucked up. Its teeth are broken. It's bloody. This was of note to me just because this is a point where the story story starts to like really skew into the dark, dark. There's some already intense scenes and everything, but this is really more of the traditional folk and fairy tale level of violence, which has a lot of like amputations, impaling, yeah, cannibalism, that sort of stuff. So we're kind of veering into that world now. When Feyre fetches the boys to come inspect this horrific find she comes across, she learns that the fairy's head has been branded with a quartz sigil, which is a mountain and three stars, the night court. If we refer back to the map at the front of the book, the Night Court is a big old hunk of land at the northernmost part of Prithian. It's steeped in mystery due to the massive mountain range along its southern border. We don't know too much about the Night Court right now, but we get the sense that it's cut off from the other courts and is a bit feared. Feyre, Tamlin tells Feyre that they are sadistic killers, in fact, and that the murdered fairy was basically a joke. Um, that they Not played. very funny. No, but it's basically like Tamlin basically says, yeah, they're uh, psychopaths and this is basically them laughing about how they could get into our court easily. And they did, man. They sure I mean, I'm did. creeped out by it. Yeah. And, and uh, besides the fact that how creeped out would you already have been because you have a bunch of people that have been watching you this entire time and then you find the head? I actually think that she has a lot more composure at this point than I would have. Excuse me. Can we have a conversation about this? What is happening? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think maybe she's just like yes anding it. She's mm. leaning in. She's like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna cut heads off. Can I still stay in the manor? Yeah. All right. Can I um, paint? Lord knows. Can I still paint? <laughs> uh, now it's so funny, Natalie, just thinking of her being like, I can draw a river, and it's just like it's, oh <laughs> just a big back, pot of paint on it. Go back and read that section. He doesn't ever say that they're beautiful or he's just he just stares he at them like say it does beautiful. sound like the way somebody would talk about something that's really bad and they don't know how to say it. Oh wow. You yeah. really you really tried. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the different colors. <laughs> different colors. Um, so chapter 25 starts, we're presented with 
Spring court in preparation for another celebration. Time has passed and we are now at the summer solstice. Or meet someone! Mass has sort of cross-blended some of the May Day tradition imagery into the scene, as did the movie Midsummer, with the flowers and the maypole and the bonfires. Feyre ponders over how long she's been here at the spring court. I don't think they actually acknowledge the month she came in. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I was always assuming it was like January. It I, seems cold. Yeah. I, I think maybe in the, one of the other books they mentioned what month it was. So... She's been there like half a year, and she wonders if her family still actually believes she's visiting her sick aunt, the story that Tamlin has glamoured them with. They don't care about you, Feyre. They, they really don't, don't care about you. They really don't. So it's sad. I feel like oftentimes, the, like, at least there's a part, like, even her mom didn't like her. Like, usually in fairy tales, I feel like there's some kind of, like, whimsy to, like, the family that loves me and took care of me. And none of them did. No. Why does she have any allegiance to them? Because she's too good for this world. Oh, that's, that's why, why she gets she's to be in, a, Yeah, that's why oh. send her to the Fae. I almost, I almost gave a spoiler and I didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, but again, it's like uh, very similar to Secret Garden where Mary Lennox's mother was um, obsessed with like stature and, and beauty and didn't really have time for her. And this is very similar to Feyre's mother's backstory. Um, so now we're at this 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 new ritual and Feyre is informed that she's invited to actually attend this one and that it's not as quite as hedonistic as the fire night ritual. Boring. In fact, this isn't even the spring court's bag, but since the blight has begun, they've taken on the summer court's big day because this is like summer, midsummer. So it's summer court's thing. The way this party is described is kind of mirroring Feyre's own mood and feelings. So Fire Night was described as sinister, wicked, dangerous. Summer Solstice is all flowers and beauty and lightness and joy. And she gets, again, another fashion. Um, she is wearing a cornflower blue chiffon gown and she leaves her hair unbound with garlands of pink and white and blue wildflowers around her head. This one doesn't quite get me as much. This fashion doesn't quite um, pin me loinally the way the last one did. <laughs> I do. I like a flower crown, obviously, but otherwise, uh, yeah. Right. Blue blue chiffon, cornflower, blue chiffon. It just makes like, me think of little women, you know? It makes me think of Belle. <laughs> yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> um, so we get a lovely visceral scene of Feyre here bedecked in flowers. She fills herself with pies and tarts and cakes while listening to a merry band of drums and fiddles. I want to go. I do. I want to go to one of these parties. Why aren't we invited to the parties? I don't know. Well, it's just like being in middle school again. Well, Feyre is... So we don't get boned by big beast men. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I didn't. I didn't. I certainly didn't. <laughs> oh, no wow. one was knocking on my back door no. or my front door. <laughs> 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 no, neither am I, thankfully. Um, well, Feyre is on one at this party and she is feeling herself, okay? So when she spies some fairy wine and Lucian warns her against it, she's like... Fuck you, I do what I want to do, yep. Lucian. And she downs the wine and she begins to experience something I would liken to tripping. Like this to me is the most trippingy version of this. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's basically high out of her mind when she drinks this, but she's having a blast. She goes full Bonnaroo. She takes her shoes off. She's just laughing and dancing around, listening. She does a line of special K. She doesn't mm -hmm. know that's what it is. And all of a sudden her legs aren't working anymore. She's trapped in a tent with a bunch of people. Am I just speaking about my Bonnaroo experience? I think that was the, the extra deleted chapter. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so she's dancing and oh, she looks up and one of the fiddle players is Tamlin. Oh my god, he also is a musician. Okay, I'm not gonna make us keep reading lines, but I love this part. Should you read it? Sweat gleamed on the strong column of his neck as he rested his chin upon the dark wood of the fiddle. He'd rolled up the sleeves of his shirt, revealing the cords of muscle along his forearms. He had once mentioned that he would have liked to be a traveling minstrel, if not a warrior or a high lord. Now, hearing him play... I knew he would have made a fortune from it. I find this, I don't know, I find this so sexy, the imagery of this with his, like, sleeves Ooh, rolled yeah. up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we both made mistakes with musicians in the past. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Because <laughs> there's something about it. When you watch a musician play, you're like, oh, you're so bad, but you're so good. Usually they're just bad. Not all musicians are bad, but <laughs> at least the ones I do know. Um, so... 
he begins to fiddle in front of Feyre and he says, dance, dance, Feyre, dance. Yeah, man. She goes, la, 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 la. And he's fiddling away. Fiddling is basically jerking off. <laughs> yeah, of course. I imagine it's just like, oh, he fiddles so hard that the fiddle bursts into flames. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't happen, but in I my mind it definitely fiddlers. happens. <laughs> That's very rude. Yeah, I'll watch um, your fiddle. Yeah, I know what that means. I know your fiddling is not sexual. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fiddling all about. Unless you're fiddling all about, then it just depends on where your hands are. Tamlin joins the melee and is it's a joyous, sexy scene of Feyre and Tamlin dancing and laughing for hours among the Fey revelers. As the moon is setting, Tamlin takes Feyre off to watch a meadow come alive with the Will of the Wisps. The Will of the Wisps. Which is a real thing. Uh, it's a real life phenomenon that has always been a part of folklore because it looks like spooky ghosts, like usually in swamps and marshes. It has something to do with science. Yep. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, it's like, it has gases, <laughs> some new gases. You know, it's a, let's not even pretend like mm. we know. It's science. It's science. Um, so, but here in this moment, it's like real creatures because they're in Feyre land. And they it provides some very sexy backdrop. Mm-hmm. During the scene, it, this is where Tamlin says that he liked to kiss Feyre. And she's like, yes, please. Okay. They have a very spicy kiss. As the sun rises, Feyre opens up to Tamlin, saying she didn't know such beauty could exist in the world. I let the dawn creep inside me, let it grow with each movement of his lips and brush of his tongue against mine. Tears pricked beneath my closed eyes. It was the happiest moment of my life. The end. The whole book's over. Nah. <laughs> um, we're, we're wrapping up towards the end of this, this uh, episode, but yes, it seems like... This wouldn't, you know, if this was the way it went, there wouldn't be five entire books. Um, So, no, it's not just like, and they lived happily ever after. Mm -mm. The next morning comes and both Tamlin and Feyre are fully lovesick. Lucian is just plain sick because he has to see their shameless flirting and it's very cute. Feyre divulges in her mind she would have let Tamlin take her on the table right there. Good Lord, she is throbbing for it. Yeah, they're both kind of just like Woo. basically about to like do it. So we would maybe have gotten that scene if not for Lucian dashing water on the couple's flames. The blight has attacked the winter court. Dun, dun, dun. It has killed a dozen of their children. In the Fey world, children are very rare. So rare that killing of 12 is almost a genocide. So just as the tri- trio is processing this terrible news, Tamlin starts. He orders Feyre to hide, and she's glamoured as they are presented with an unexpected guest. From her hiding spot, Feyre is shocked to see that this unwanted guest is none other than the beautiful male who saved her from those three fairies on fire night. Tamlin remained seated. With his back to me, I couldn't see his face. But Tamlin's voice was laced with the promise of violence, as he said, what do you want, Recent? His name is Recent. And we have to ta- stop here. This is how it is pronounced in the Audible book. I know a lot of people... Uh, in my brain, I say Rezond. I also say Rezond. I don't think that that's the correct pronunciation of it. Because the audiobook says Recent. Yes. But I want we want you to know that this is something we had a at least four and a half minute discussion about yeah. before we started this episode. Yes. But we want you to know that we hear you and your thoughts. And I and say Rezond. <laughs> yeah. But it's Recent. Recent. Apparently. So this man's name is Recent. We learn a few things in this this little interaction, actually. And Reason's appearance seems to only antagonize Tamlin, and Tamlin is pissed. As they speak, Reason takes credit for the severed head. So he's basically toying with Tamlin and Lucian, and he calls him a stubborn bastard for being holed up in his manor uh, instead of being with the rest of them, quote, under the mountain. So this is a new term. And then... I don't think it's like under the sea, though. I'm pretty sure there's no lobsters singing. I no. think that usually all the shells are not for laying about um, or putting on your breasts. <laughs> but I don't know what happens under the mountain. Under the mountain! <laughs> under the mountain! I can't. I shouldn't sing like. Um, I was going to call him Geppetto. I think it was slight. It was slight. <laughs> No, Sebastian. Sebastian is his name. Yes, not Geppetto. (laughs) Although you can put Geppetto far under the water. I'm fine with it. Yeah, Geppetto's a bastard. I think I hate Geppetto. He's a creep, man. He's a weird little pedo. (laughs) Um, 
Oh my You're god, Geppetto. his name is Geppetto. Oh my god. <laughs> it's right there. I never thought about this before. Damn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it's not the same under the mountain. No. And then Lucian, who is trying to defend Tamlin, he says, What do you know about anything? You're just Amarantha's whore. <gasps> Amarantha. Hmm? The bitch has a name. The bitch, her, the she, has a name. Also, uh, we find out very quickly, Rhysand is a high lord of Prithian, not just from another court, but a high lord of that court. Rhysand, or Rhys, as he's often called, figures out that Fair is in the room, even though she was cloaked by Tamlin, and he goes into a little bit of a rage. How dare Dare they try to trick him? He reveals Feyre and begins to torment her. He calls her mortal trash. He lets her know that he could shatter her mind like an eggshell. Ah! Through his magic, he needles into her brain and she gets a real scope of his powers, describing it as a talon scraping against her brain. Ooh. He also humiliates her, revealing her sexual desirous thoughts about Tamlin. As if they didn't know. I know. Like, they fucking know. He threatens to tell this all to Amarantha. He threatens Tamlin with this. And in order to protect Feyre, Tamlin gets on his knees and grovels in front of Recent. Recent finds this very funny and says he hasn't decided whether or not he's going to tell Amarantha. Hmm. Before he goes, he asks Feyre her name. She's terrified that the Blight will go after her family if she's honest. So she says the first name that comes to her mind. Claire Better. It's a friend of her sister's from back home in the village, one that's actually mentioned earlier on in the book. Reason says he can't wait to see the three of them under this mountain. And then he vanishes. Under the mountain. <laughs> no, it's not like that. Everyone is shaken by this interaction. What if she did show up under the mountain? Everyone's like singing and dancing and having a great time, though. It'd be a very different book. Mm. Uh, favorite, maybe that would be the Disney version of this. Oh. Um, everyone is shaken by the interaction. Feyre's mind is still reeling from this invasion as Tamlin enters her room and tells her that he has taken on her life debt. And he presents her with the shocking news that she is free, free to go home, except she no longer wants to be free. No. And she realizes that cottage in the village was not her home. No, they don't love you, girl. She doesn't want to leave Tamlin's side. I was quite shocked when this scene happened when I read it the first time. Yeah. Tamlin says, no, she has to leave. She's forbidden to stay. She insists that she can help and all this. And while I usually want to be on the side of the woman standing her ground, Tamlin is probably correct in this moment. I'd probably listen. Yeah. He can't protect himself, let alone her. So she's as fragile as a flea to this Amarantha bitch. After arguing, she begins to face the reality of the situation. But not forever, right? Even if the blight spread to the spring court again, even if it could shred me apart, I would come back. He brushed the hair from my face. I shook him off. I suppose it'll be easier if I'm gone, I said, looking away from him. Who wants someone around who's so covered in thorns? Thorns! <laughs> thorns? Thorny. Prickly, sour, contrary. He leaned forward and kissed me lightly. Not forever, he said onto my mouth. And though I knew it was a lie, I put my arms around his neck and kissed him. So we finally get to the very sexy, sexy, sex scene here. But it's marred knowing that they are to be separated. Mm. It's a bummer. It's not a full unleashing, in my opinion, because of all of the sorrow mixed into it. Still very enjoyable read. And here we see the consent king. Twice he pulls away to make sure she's okay. His kissing was slower this time, gentler. The fingertips of his other hand slipped beneath the waist of my undergarment, and I sucked in a breath. He hesitated at the sound, pulling back slightly, but I bit his lip in a silent command that had him growling into my mouth. <laughs> wow! So this is a sex scene that I would actually like to revisit once again when we're further in the books, but because my thoughts on it are based on future information. So I don't want to say too much right now. The next morning. It's really hard not to um, spoil things. I know. 
<laughs> Why not? <laughs> I didn't know that this was going to be so difficult. <laughs> but isn't it a fun, sexy game? <laughs> it is a sexy, sexy game. The next morning, it's uh, he wants her out immediately. He has she has to leave for her own safety, which does make it sound a little bit like he's just used her for sex. And he's like, "Baby, yeah, you gotta, yeah. I you gotta, gotta go. Oh, you gotta go. Oh, yeah, oh. the time, man. Oh, oh no." But it's not the case. So he really wants to save her and protect her. In his mind, this is the best thing he can do. We see another face in here, and it is sort of indicative of how. Uh, this is wrong because she gets put in this weird little like lacy white and pink and blue a like, human outfit. It looks very. It makes me think of like the Mary Poppins outfit, like mm-hmm. the way where, where it's just like and she's she actually says I half expected a parasol to go with it because it's very much like goofy almost. As she's getting into the carriage, Tamlin has set up for her. She's not tied to a horse this time. She's all gussied up. Their last moments together are shared through this carriage, and Tamlin says, "I love you." Feyre's response to this. I should say it. I should say those words. But they got stuck in my throat because... Because of what he had to face. Because he might not find me again despite his promise. Because... Because beneath it all, he was an immortal. And I would grow old and die. And maybe he meant it now. And perhaps last night had been as altering for him as it had been for me. But I would not become a burden to him. I would not become another weight pressing upon his shoulders. So she doesn't say it back. And she leaves. Again, I was really shocked the first time I read this that he was really sending her off. I was I thought for I sure I can't believe she left. I can't believe she actually did it. I know. I thought for sure something would happen before that. Their sex scene in the previous chapter was too sad. I and know. then they did it and then he, she'd leave. But no, he sends her Although away. I get it. That was usually my move. I was in the middle of the night kind of gal. I'd be out. <laughs> like, bye. I don't know you really, so I gotta go. But she has to go back to her wretched family who's so mean to who her. Who don't care about her. <laughs> yeah. The home that Feyre returns home to is quite different from the cottage that she left at the beginning of the book. She is driven to a sprawling mansion, a, quote, chateau of white marble and emerald roofs. And as she arrives, she's greeted by her sisters, who don't immediately recognize her. Remember, when she left, she was dressed in hunting clothes, starving and emaciated. Now she's become a soft woman. Fine clothing. No thanks to them. No thanks to them. They come in to greet her. uh, Like, they think she's a visitor. They give her, like, the little curtsies. And when she laughs and says, it's me, her sister, Feyre. The respective reactions really give you a good, a good glimpse of the differences in the sisters. And we're going to talk a little bit about this more at the beginning of next episode because we're about to wrap up. But, you know, you see their personalities here. Elaine's elated but kind of flighty. And Nesta is her own thing. That's a nice way of saying she's a bitch. Yeah. So this is their action. Why are you being so quiet? Nesta said, keeping her distance. I'd forgotten how cunning her eyes were, how cold. She'd been made differently from something harder and stronger than bone and blood. She was as different from the humans around us as I had become. So this is how Nesta reacts. Elaine's twittering around her like a bird, and Feyre comes to an understanding of what Tamlin did for her family. He glamoured them and and afterwards arranged so that a man would come and ask her father for uh, help investing money. And it renews her father, and he turns their fortune around. So it's all, like, I, I hate her family. Yeah. They, the, the only reason why, like, oh, everything's fine again is because they have money. That they, teaches no one anything. But it does show that like, they are a little bit shallow. Yes. When And not like a star is born. Whoa! Um so yes, they're not evil, but they're you know they're a little they're a little depthless, I yeah. would say, um, at least initially. And when Pharaoh's father, you know, he loves his daughter. When he sees her again, he falls to his knees and declares that he will hold a ball in her oh, honor. Oh, shut up! <laughs> so the Archer Archeron family has come into this like level of wealth associated with fantasy and fairy tales. It's the sort of Aladdin chest of. You know, gold and jewels and rubies. Like and Tamlin really out. did take care of them. Yes. And f- he also left Pharaoh with a- another old sack of money. So she has her own money on top of their money. So Pharaoh's happy to see her family fed and healthy, but is not acclimating. She's thinking about the spring court. She doesn't really want to be here. And she's worried about what's happening in Prithian. So she tries to, like, integrate herself. She takes bags of gold and gives them out to the villagers in her town. 
She helps Elaine garden, but she's just not really there. So Feyre's ball goes on as planned. She's not super interested, but wants to be gracious to Elaine and her father for their hard work. The next morning, as her family is sitting down to breakfast, this is how we're going to wrap up this episode with this scene. I'm thinking of buying the better land. My father was saying to Elaine, who was the only one of us listening to him. I heard a rumor it'll go up for sale soon, since none of the family survived, and it would be a good investment property. Perhaps one of you girls might build a house on it when you're ready. Elaine nodded interestedly, but I blinked. What happened to the betters? Oh, it was awful, Elaine said. Their house burned down and everyone died. Well, they couldn't find Claire's body, but... She looked down at her plate. It happened in the dead of night. The family, their servants, everyone. The day before you came home to us, actually. I had given that name to Reesend, and he had not forgotten it. I just got shivers as if I don't know what's about to happen. (laughs) Uh, It's a good. But shit's about to get real. Like, hold on to your butts, especially if you are reading along with us. Shit is about to go down. It is quite a shift. Like, this is really where you see a shift from a basic fairy tale story into something else, which is, I find really fascinating and what really hooked me into the rest of the series. So yeah, that was uh, that was fun, Jackie. Yeah, we got man. through some of the beginning sexes. We're starting to get drippy in here. I mean, I'm and excited. there's story, there's other stories. Sure, 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 no, no, the story also gets really good and there's like a lot of other great characters that we're going to meet, but also, ha, eh. So hot here! Yeah, what's man. That, wait, what's that song? You ever heard it before? Getting hot in here? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember. That I'm part. doing the breakdown. Hot here, hot here. I, I think that's see. how the the song starts. Mm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we will be back next week with some more spice and some other. This is going to be crazy the next episode. Spice and violence, but again, not Dune spice, very different kind of spice. Different kind, but there is a worm. Oh, oh but there, oh, we're going to meet a worm. But it's not Dune. No. It's not Dune.